Thank you for joining us uh, this morning at Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church uh, for our regular Sunday morning worship uh, event. Uh, we're located at 1667 South Lauderdale Street, Memphis, Tennessee, and we're so happy that you're joining us. And especially Mount Sinai members, we are delighted that you have given your time once again uh, and joined together to worship God through his word. Um, we are working on a, a series titled, Show Me Me, God Show Me Me. And, and uh, we're working, we've been working from Isaiah chapter one through chapter six, and we're now at the beginning of chapter five, and we're going to title today's ser sermon, uh, The Vineyard of the Lord is Destroyed. And our text is Isaiah chapter five, verse one through seven. Let's read that. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yield wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove it. I will remove the hedge just, and, and, and it will be devoured and I will break down its walls and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste and it shall not be pruned or hoed and bear briars and thorns shall grow up. And I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. And then verse seven says, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you would help us to bear much fruit because of our personal relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The first seven verses of chapter five are a song by the prophet Isaiah. Perhaps the reason that he puts it in a form of a song is because his preaching has fallen on deaf ears. So now he attempts to capture their attention with a song. So some discussion had taken place between theologians as to whether this was a parable or an allegory. Here's some information that will hopefully help us to decide for ourselves whether it is a parable or an allegory. A parable is a short, simple story designed to communicate a spiritual truth, religious principle, or a moral lesson. It's a figure of speech in which truth is illustrated by a comparison or an example drawn from everyday experiences. The Greek word for parable means to lay beside or a casting alongside, and thus a comparison or likeness. In a parable, it is sometime, uh, something that is placed alongside something else in order that one may throw light on the other. A familiar custom or incident is used 
to illustrate some truth that uh, is less familiar. Now, an allegory is a figurative sentence or discourse in which the principal subject is described by another subject resembling it in its properties and circumstances. The real subject is kept out of view and we are left to collect the intentions of the writer or speaker by the resemblance of the secondary uh, to the primary subject. The example used in Isaiah chapter 5, 1 through 7, it uses Israel as the primary subject and the other subject is the vineyard. The primary subject, Israel, is kept out of sight while the, 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 the secondary subject is the vineyard that all of the light is shined on. And it's basically used as an example to help us to see Israel and ourselves, hopefully. Again, Israel is kept out of view to Isaiah's hearers, while the vineyard is used as a resemblance to Israel. Now, Jesus spoke in parables many times in his teachings and his sermons. His two most famous parables are the parable of the lost son that's found in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. And the second one is the parable of the good Samaritan found in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 37. Now, both of these parables illustrates God's love for sinners and God's command that we show compassion to all people. Actually, the parable of the lost son, sometimes called the parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the loving father, is the story of two sons. The younger son, that's representative of the tax collectors and prostitutes, the no goods of society, who wasted their possession with indulgent living and then the older son, typical of the self-righteous scribes and Pharisees and the self-righteous people of our day, he was the one who remained at home but was a stranger to his father's heart. So we see the similarities between Israel and the vineyard. The vineyard had been well cared for by the owner. The owner ensured that the hillside where the vineyard was did not suffer from soil erosion. The hillside was restructured so that the vineyard was always receiving more than adequate water supply. God had treated Israel similarly by caring for all her needs so that she could always produce an excellent harvest. Israel had repeatedly squandered the resources supplied by God for her to be productive. Now, God sees no other alternative but to destroy the vineyard. In my backyard, I have two peach trees. I purchased the peach trees on the same day, at the same place. For three years, one peach tree has produced a good return of peaches, while the other has not yielded a single peach. I've threatened to cut the non-peach bearing tree down year after year, but compassion has saved it every time. But this year, the time has come for me to destroy the unproductive peach tree. Just as it is, it was not my intentions to plant the tree just to, uh, to, to bear leaves, but for it to bear peaches. God did not create us 
just to look good. He created us for his glory. Our worship is us showing what God is worth to us. And we glorify God in how we live. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 2 says, When you pass through the water, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you or overflow you or drown you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. So when we go through trials and tribulations and come through unscathed, we are showing God's glory at work in us. And then verse four, seven of the same chapter, verse, chapter 43 of Isaiah says, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, God says, whom I formed and made. How dare we decide that this is our lives and we're going to live it any way we choose. Life teaches us that living for God's glory is far more enriching and satisfying than living for our own glory. To be God's glory means his beauty and power and honor and a quality of God's character that emphasizes his greatness and his authority. The word glory of God is used in three senses in the Bible. And I'll share those three senses with you and then I'll move on. The first one is God's moral beauty and perfection of character. In other words, God's beauty and perfection is shown in his character. And God wants to use us to show the world him in us. So God wants to display, uh, to put on display his beauty and perfection in the lives that we live. And, 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 and without God, this divine quality is beyond man's understanding. Check out Psalms 113 verse 4 on that when you get a chance. And Romans 3 and 23 reminds us that we all fall short of God's glory. So we should not get the big head. Getting the big head does not glorify God, but humility and love. Those are some of the things that demonstrate that we are living lives that gives God glory. The second thing is God's moral beauty and perfection shown as a visible presence in and with us. This is not in my notes, but let me just, just remind us of, of a verse that I think it's found in Acts. In him we live, move, and have our being. You see me moving my hands, my lips, my eyes. And if you are alive, you have the ability to move. That is a visible showing of God's beauty and perfection and his presence in and with us. Because in him we live, move, and have our being. Without him we are nothing without but, but dust, and without him we can do nothing. 
but fail. While God's glory is not a substance, at times God does reveal his perfection to man in a visible way. Such a display of the presence of God is often seen as a fire or dazzling light, but sometimes as an act of power. Some examples from the Old Testament are the pillar of cloud by day that Israel followed and the pillar of fire by night that they followed, that God showed his presence with them 24-7 and he was guiding them to the promised land. And the Lord's deliverance of Israel at the Red Sea was another display of God's power, of his glory, working in the lives of the Israelites. He had brought them out of bondage in Egypt, and now he's leading them to a land flowing with milk and honey. And he's with them every step of the way. Is not that the way God is with us? He has freed us from the bondage of sin, at least from the presence of sin, from the penalty of sin. And I think I'll, I'll discuss that further a little later on. He has, he has already freed us from the penalty of sin. We are being freed from the uh, power of sin, and we're going to be freed from the presence of sin. Since the close of the Old Testament, the glory of God has been shown mainly in Christ and in the members of his church. John 2 and 11 says, for this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Canaan of Galilee. You know what that was when he changed water into wine at the, at, the, at the wedding reception in Canaan of Galilee. And many, and, and he manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. I think this would be a good place for me to remind us that when we allow God to manifest his glory in us, people will believe in him. And that's the first step to salvation. Christ now shares his divine glory with his followers so that in their lives, that's us, Christians are being transformed into the glorious image of God. John chapter 17, verse five and six says, and now father glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. When we keep God's word, that's a way of displaying God's glory in us. John 17 and 22 says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. This is Jesus talking to the Father. The glory that you have given me, I have given it to them. That's us. That they may be one even as we are one. So when we display unity, we are displaying God's glory. We are bearing good fruit. And we can bear much fruit when we display his glory. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse 18 says, and we all with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, a few minutes ago, I mentioned about how uh, we've been freed from the penalty of sin. We're being freed from 
the uh, power of sin and we shall be freed from the presence of sin. On Calvary, Jesus provided justification, a legal term. In other words, uh, we were out of fellowship with God. We were enemies of God. But Jesus, by shedding his blood, cleansed us so that he could set us right with God. And then from the time of his ascension to the time when he returns, we're in a period of being sanctified, a period of sanctification. And the Holy Spirit is in charge of that. He's working to transform us by the renewing of our minds. We're being transformed. And then when Jesus comes back, the sanctification will be completed. We don't know what we're going to be like, but we know we'll be like him. And we will be completely set aside for God's use. And then comes glorification. Glorification is the presence of God. And sin cannot dwell in God's presence. Enough of that. Believers will be fully glorified at the end of time in heavenly, in God's heavenly presence. Colossians chapter 3 verse 4 says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Here's how we produce much fruit. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, and I'll read through verse 14. It said, put, then, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you so you also must forgive. And above all things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. The glory of God will be seen everywhere. Revelations 21 and 23 says, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine in it. For the glory of God gives it light and his lamp is the lamb. No wonder the psalmist says in 119 verse 105, I believe it is, that the Lord is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He's talking of how God, uh, through his word, is to us now and how it's going to be in the future, moving from degree to degree. The last thing uh, is praise. At time, God's glory means the honor and praise which his creatures give to him. Revelation 5 and 12 says, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessings. We can never accuse the Lord of not being compassionate towards us because each and every day that we live, it's because of his grace, his mercy, and his compassion to us. And that's the way we should be to one another in order to bear much fruit. We should extend grace to each other, mercy to each other, and compassion. We should have compassion on one another. Each day, we should present ourselves 
as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. One version says, which is not too much for God to ask of us. Here's a poem that I love. A dear friend of mine that's gone on to be with the Lord used to always quote this poem. It's titled, The Farmer and the Plow. The farmer plows through the field of green, and the blade of the plow is sharp and keen. But the seed must be sown to bring forth grain, for nothing is born without suffering and pain. And God never plows in the soul of man without intentions and purpose and pain. So whenever you feel the plow's sharp blade, let not your heart be sorely afraid. For like the farmer, God chooses a field from which he expects an excellent yield. So rejoice though your heart is broken in two. Remember, God seeks to bring forth a rich harvest in you. That's by Helen Steiner Rice. God's glory was displayed in his son on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary where the sun refused to shine and Jesus laid down his life for sinners. On the third day, early the third day morning, Jesus rose from the dead with all power in heaven and in earth in his hand. And that's why we can look to each new day as a day of joy. And we can say each morning, one glad morning, when this life is over, I'll fly away and be at rest because my labor here will be done. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We pray now that you will give the increase as you always do, that you would uh, help us to understand what we've heard so that we can become more than just do hearers of your word, but that we can become doers of your word also. And by becoming doers of your word, just as you bless us, we can become a blessing to someone else. And I believe that's a good way of describing bearing fruit. So thank you for your word, and we ask that you would make it come alive in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's it for today. Love you. Thank you for joining us and stay strong in the faith and we'll see you next time.